Chapter Seven and Eight of the Haunted House on Duchess Street. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gerard Street Mystery and Other Weird Tales by John Charles Dent. The Haunted House on Duchess Street. Chapter Seven. The Black Dog and His Master. At the sale of Captain Bywater's effects, a portion of the furniture belonging to the dining-room, kitchen, and one bedroom were purchased by Jim Summers, who, with his wife, continued to reside in the Duchess Street house pending the letting of it to a new tenant. These temporary occupants thus lived in three rooms, their sleeping apartment being in the upper story at the northern side of the house, and on the opposite side of the hall from the large room which had been the scene of so much recent dissipation. All the rest of the house was left bare, and the doors of the unoccupied rooms were kept locked. Summers found employment as porter and assistant in Hamill's grocery store, but his wife was always on hand to show the premises to any one who might wish to see them. All went on quietly until nearly a month after the funeral. Mrs. Summers had an easy time of it, as no intending tenants presented themselves, and her only visitor was her married sister, who occasionally dropped in for an hour's chat. Jim was always at home by seven in the evening and the time glided by without anything occurring to disturb the smooth current of their lives. But this state of things was not to be of long continuance. One night, when Mr. Washburn was busy over his briefs in his study at home, he was disturbed by a loud knocking at his front door. As it was nearly midnight, and as everyone else in the house had retired to rest, he answered the summons in person. Upon unfastening the door, he found Jim and his wife at the threshold. They were only half-dressed, and their countenances were colorless as pallid amours. They stumbled impetuously into the hall, and were evidently laboring under some tremendous excitement. The lawyer conducted them into the study, where they poured into his astonished ears a most singular tale. Their story was to the effect that they had been disturbed for several nights previously by strange and inexplicable noises in the house occupied by them on Duchess Street. They had been aroused from sleep at indeterminate hours, by the sound of gliding footsteps just outside of the door of their bedroom. Once they had distinctly heard the sound of voices, which seemed to come from the large front room across the hall. As the door of that room was fast closed and locked, they had not been able to distinguish the particular words, but they both declared that the voice was marvelously like that of Captain Bywater. They were persons of fairly steady nerves, but their situation, all things considered, was solitary and peculiar, and they had not by any means relished these unaccountable manifestations. On each occasion, however, they had controlled themselves sufficiently to institute a vigorous investigation of the premises, but had discovered nothing to throw any light upon the subject. They had found all the doors and the windows securely fastened, and there was no sign of the presence of anything or anybody to account for the gliding footsteps. They had unlocked and entered the front room, and found it bare and deserted as it had been left, ever since the removal of the furniture after the sale. They had even gone to the length of unlocking and entering every other room in the house, but had found no clue to the mysterious sounds which had disturbed them. Then they had argued themselves into the belief that imagination had imposed upon them, or that there was some natural but undiscovered cause for what had occurred. They were reluctant to make themselves the laughing-stock of the town by letting the idea get abroad that they were afraid of ghosts, and they determined to hold their tongues but the manifestations had at last assumed a complexion which rendered it impossible to pursue such a course any longer, and they vehemently protested that they could not pass another night in the accursed house for any bribe that could be offered them. They had spent the preceding evening at home as usual, and had gone to bed a little before ten o'clock. The recent manifestations had probably left some lingering trace upon their nerves, but they had no premonitions of further experiences of the same character, and had soon dropped to sleep. They knew not how long they had slept when they were suddenly, and simultaneously rendered broad awake, by a succession of sounds which could not possibly be explained by any reference to mere imagination. They heard the voice of their late master as distinctly as they had ever heard it during his life. As before, it emanated from the front room, but this time there was no possibility of their being deceived, as they caught not only the sound of his voice, but also certain words which they had often heard from his lips in bygone times. "'Don't spare the liquor, gentlemen,' roared the captain. "'There's plenty more where that came from. More sugar and lemon, you scoundrel, and be handy there with the hot water.' Then there was heard the jingling of glasses, and loud rapping, as if made with the knuckles of the hand upon the table. Other voices were now heard joining in conversation, 
but too indistinctly for the now thoroughly frightened listeners to catch any of the actual words. There could, however, be no mistake. Captain Bywater had certainly come back from the land of shadows, and reinstituted the old orgies in the old spot. The uproar lasted for at least five minutes, when the captain gave one of his characteristic drunken howls, and of a sudden all was still and silent as the grave. As might naturally have been expected, the listeners were terror-stricken. For a few moments after the cessation of the disturbance, they lay there in silent, open-mouthed wonderment and fear. Then, before they could find their voices, their ears were assailed by a loud noise in the hall below, followed by the muffled bow-wow of a dog, the sound of which seemed to come from the landing at the head of the stairway. Jim could stand the pressure of the situation no longer. He sprang from the bed, lighted a candle, and rushed out into the hall. This he did, as he afterwards admitted, not because he felt brave, but because he was too terrified to remain in bed, and seemed to be impelled by a resolve to face the worst that fate might have in store for him. Just as he passed from the door into the hall, a heavy footstep was heard slowly ascending the stairs. He paused where he stood, candle in hand. The steps came on, 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 with measured tread. A moment more, and he caught sight of the ascending figure. Horror of horrors! It was his late master, clothes, cane, and all, just as he had been in life, and at the head of the stairs stood Nero, who gave vent to another low bark of recognition. When the captain reached the landing-place, he turned halfway round, and the light of the candle fell full upon his face. Jim saw the whole outline with the utmost clearness, even to the expression in the eyes, which was neither gay nor sad, but rather stolid and stern, just what he had been accustomed to see there. The dog crouched back against the wall, and after a brief halt near the stairhead, Captain Bywater turned the knob of his bedroom door and passed in. The dog followed, the door was closed, and once more all was silent. Jim turned and encountered the white face of his wife. She had been standing behind him all the while, and had seen everything just as it had been presented to his own eyes. Moreover, impelled by some inward prompting for which she could never account, she had counted the footsteps as they had ascended the stairs. They had been exactly seventeen. The pair re-entered their room and took hurried counsel together. They had distinctly seen the captain turn the knob and pass into his bedroom, followed by the semblance of Nero. As they well knew, the door of that room was locked, and the key was at that moment in the pocket of Mrs. Summer's dress. In sheer desperation, they resolved at all hazards to unlock the door and enter the room. Mrs. Summers produced the key and handed it to her husband. She carried the candle and accompanied him to the stairhead. He turned the lock and pushed the door wide open before him, and both advanced into the room. It was empty, and the window was found firmly fastened on the inside, as it had been left weeks before. They returned to their own bedroom, and agreed that any further stay in such a house of horrors was not to be thought of. Hastily arraying themselves in such clothing as came readily to hand, they passed down the stairway, unbolted the front door, blew out the light, and made their way into the open air. Then they relocked the door from the outside and left the place. Their intended destination was the home of Mrs. Summer's sister, but they determined to go round by Mr. Washburn's and tell him their story, as they knew he kept late hours and would most likely not have gone to bed. Mr. Washburn, stolid man of law though he was, could not listen to such a narrative without perceptible signs of astonishment. After thinking over the matter a few moments, he requested his visitors to pass the night under his roof, and to keep their own counsel for the present about their strange experiences. As he well knew, if the singular story got wind, there would be no possibility of finding another tenant for the vacant house. The young couple acceded to the first request, and promised compliance with the second. They were then shown to a spare room, and the marvels of that strange night were at an end. Next morning, at an early hour, the lawyer and the ex-serving man proceeded to the Duchess Street house. Everything was as it had been left the night before, and no clue could be found to the mysterious circumstances so solemnly attested to by Jim Summers and his spouse. The perfect sincerity of the couple could not be doubted, but Mr. Washburn was on the whole disposed to believe that they had in some way been imposed upon by designing persons who wished to frighten them off the premises, or that their imaginations had played them a scurvy trick. With a renewed caution as to silence he dismissed them, and thenceforth they took up their abode in the house of Mrs. Summers' sister on Palace Street. Mr. and Mrs. Summers kept their mouths as close as, under these circumstances, could reasonably have been expected of them, but it was necessary to account in some way for their sudden desertion of the Duchess Street house, 
and Mrs. Summer's sister was of an inquisitive disposition. By degrees she succeeded in getting at most of the facts, but to do her justice she did not proclaim them from the housetops, and for some time the secret was pretty well kept. The story would probably not have become generally known at all, but for a succession of circumstances which took place when the haunted house had been vacant about two months. An American immigrant named Horsfall arrived at York with a view of settling there and opening out a general store. He was a man of family, and of course required a house to live in. It so happened that the store rented to him on King Street had no house attached to it, and it was therefore necessary for him to look out for a suitable place elsewhere. Hearing that a house on Duchess Street was to let, he called and went over the premises with Mr. Washburn, who naturally kept silent as to the supernatural appearances which had driven the Summerses from the door in the middle of the night. The inspection proved satisfactory, and Mr. Horsfall took the place for a year. His household consisted of his wife, two grown-up daughters, a son in his fifteenth year, and a black female servant. They came up from Utica in advance of Mr. Horsfall's expectations, and before the house was ready for them, but matters were pushed forward with all possible speed, and on the evening of the second day after their arrival they took possession of the place. The furniture was thrown in higgledy-piggledy, and all attempts to put things to rights were postponed until the next day. The family walked over after tea from the inn at which they had been staying, resolving to rough it for a single night in their new home, in preference to passing another night amid countless swarms of the pestilence that walketh in darkness. Two beds were hastily made up on the floor of the drawing-room, one for the occupation of Mr. and Mrs. Horsfall, and the other for the two young women. A third bed was hastily extemporized on the floor of the dining-room for the occupation of Master George Washington, and Dinah found repose on a lounge in the adjacent kitchen. The entire household went to bed, sometime between ten and eleven o'clock, all pretty well tired, and prepared for a comfortable night's rest. They had been in bed somewhat more than an hour, when the whole family was aroused by the barking of a dog in the lower hall. This was, not unnaturally, regarded as strange, inasmuch as all the doors and windows had been carefully fastened by Mr. Horsfall before retiring, and there had certainly been no dog in the house then. The head of the family lost no time in lighting a candle and opening the door into the hall. At the same moment, young G. W. opened the door on the opposite side. Yes, there, sure enough, was a large black Newfoundland dog, seemingly very much at home, as though he belonged to the place. As the youth advanced towards him, he retreated to the stairway, up which he passed at a great padding pace. How on earth had he gained an entrance? Well, at all events he must be got rid of, but he looked as if he would be an awkward customer to tackle at close quarters, and Mr. Horsfall deemed it prudent to put on a part of his clothing before making any attempt to expel him. While he was dressing, the tread of the animal on the floor of the upper hall could be distinctly heard, and ever and anon he emitted a sort of low barking sound which was ominous of a disposition to resent any interference with him. By this time all the members of the household were astir and clustering about the lower hall. Mr. Horsfall, with a lighted candle in one hand and a stout cudgel in the other, passed up the stairs and looked along the passage. Why, what on earth had become of the dog? It was nowhere to be seen. Where could it have hidden itself? It was certainly too large an animal to have taken refuge in a rat-hole. Had it entered one of the rooms? Impossible, for they were all closed, though not locked, Mr. H. himself having unlocked them in the course of the afternoon, when some furniture had been taken into them. He, however, looked into each room in succession, only to find darkness there and nothing more. Then he concluded that the brute must have gone downstairs while he had been putting on his clothes in the room below. No, that could not be, for George Washington had never left the foot of the stairway from the moment the dog first passed up. Had it jumped through one of the windows? No, they were all fast and intact. Had it gone up the chimney in the front room? No, apart from the absurdity of the idea, the hole was not large enough to admit of a dog one-fifth its size. In vain the house was searched through and through. Not a sign of the huge disturber of the domestic peace was to be seen anywhere. After a while Mr. Horsfall, at a loss for anything better to exercise his faculties upon, opened both the front and back doors and looked all over the premises, alternately calling, Carlo, watch, and every other name which occurred to him as likely to be borne by a dog. There was no response, and in sheer disgust he re-entered the house and again sought his couch. In a few minutes more the household was again locked in slumber, but they were not at the end of their annoyances. About half an hour after midnight they were once more aroused, this time by the sound of loud voices in the large upper room. 
"'I tell you we will all have glasses round,' roared a stentorian voice. "'I will knock down the first man who objects.' Everybody in the house heard the voice and the words. This was apparently more serious than the dog. Mr. H. regretted that he had left his pistols at the inn, but he determined to rid the place of the intruders, whoever they might be. Grasping the cudgel, he again made his way upstairs, candle in hand. When more than halfway up, he caught sight of a tall, heavily built, red-faced man who had apparently emerged from the larger room, and who was just on the point of opening the door of the back bedroom. "'Who are you, you scoundrel?' exclaimed Mr. H. The man apparently neither saw nor heard him, but opened the door with tranquil unconcern and passed into the room. Mr. H. followed quickly at his very heels, only to find that he had been beguiled with a counterfeit, and that there was no one there. Then he stepped back into the hallway, and entered the larger room with cudgel raised, fully expecting to find several men there. To his unspeakable astonishment he found nobody. Again he hurried from room to room, upstairs and downstairs. Again he examined the doors and windows, to see if the fastings had been tampered with. No, all was tight and snug. The family were again astir, hurrying hither and thither, in quest of they knew not what, but they found nothing to reward their search, and after a while all gathered together half-clad in the dining-room, where they began to ask each other what these singular disturbances could mean. Mr. Horsfall was a plain, matter-of-fact personage, and up to this moment no idea of any supernatural visitation had so much as entered his mind. Even now he scouted the idea, when it was timidly broached by his wife. He, however, perceived plainly enough that this was something altogether out of the common way, and he announced his intention of going to bed no more that night. The others lay down again, but we may readily believe that they slept lightly, if at all, though nothing more occurred to disturb them. Soon after daylight all the family rose and dressed for the day. Once more they made tour after tour through all the rooms, only to find that everything remained precisely as it had been left on the preceding night. After an early breakfast, Mr. H. proceeded to the house of Mr. Washburn, where he found that gentleman was still asleep, and that he could not be disturbed. The visitor was a patient man, and declared his intention of waiting. In about an hour Mr. Washburn came downstairs, and heard the extraordinary story which his tenant had to relate. He had certainly not anticipated anything of this sort, and gave vehement utterance to his surprise. In reply to Mr. H.'s enquiries about the house, however, he gave him a brief account of the life and death of Captain Bywater, and supplemented the biography by a narration of the singular experiences of Jim Summers and his wife. Then the American, fired up, alleged that his landlord had had no right to let him the house, and to permit him to remove his family into it, without acquainting him with the facts beforehand. The lawyer admitted that he had perhaps been to blame, and expressed his regret. The tenant declared that he then and there threw up his tenancy, and that he would vacate the house in the course of the day. Mr. Washburn felt that a court of law would probably hesitate to enforce a lease under such circumstances, and assented that the arrangement between them should be treated as cancelled. CHAPTER Eight, THE LAST OF THE HOUSE And cancelled it was. Mr. Horsfall temporarily took his family and his other belongings back to the inn, but soon afterwards secured a house where no guests, canine or otherwise, were in the habit of intruding themselves uninvited in the silent watches of the night. He kept a store there for some years, and, I believe, was buried at York. A son of his, as I am informed, probably the same who figures in the foregoing narrative, is, or lately was, a well-to-do resident of Syracuse, New York. Mr. Horsfall made no secret of his reasons for throwing up his tenancy, and his adventures were soon noised about throughout the town. He was the last tenant of the somber house. Thenceforth, no one could be induced to rent it, or even to occupy it rent-free. It was commonly regarded as a wished, gruesome spot, and was thoroughly unproductive to its owners. Its subsequent history has already been given. And now, what more is there to tell? Only this, that the main facts of the foregoing story are true— of course I am not in a position to vouch for them from personal knowledge, any more than I am in a position to personally vouch for the invasion of England by William of Normandy. But they rest on as good evidence as most other private events of sixty-odd years ago, and there is no reason for doubting their literal truth. With regard to the supernatural element, I am free to confess that I am not able to accept it in entirety. This is not because I question the veracity of those who vouch for the alleged facts, but because I have not received those facts at first hand, and because I am not very ready to believe in the supernatural at all. I think that, in the case under consideration, an intelligent investigation at the time might probably have brought to light circumstances 
as to which the narrative as it stands is silent. Be that as it may, the tale is worth the telling, and I have told it. End of chapter 8 End of The Haunted House on Duchess Street